All right, hello to my friends who are joining us via recording. Today is April 8th, and we are reviewing for the unit number three exam. So we've mainly got topics from lesson number nine about muscles and lesson number 10 about neurons that we're gonna spend most of our time on today. One of the things we wanted to focus on was big picture how muscle contraction works. So this is gonna be lesson number nine. Let me find the picture I'm gonna use for this. And then I'll have the class help me out here. Um, let's start with this picture. Can you guys tell me in the updated number nine packet, what page do we have this picture on? Lesson number nine. Okay, I may be hearing a page eight potentially in your notes. Yeah, okay, so it looks like it might be page eight. Um, the benefit of this picture on page eight is that it's gonna kind of show you every part of muscle contraction. So if we can kind of explain what's going on in each of these parts, that's gonna help you out when you're trying to talk about the entire process from beginning to end. The process of muscle contraction relies on us starting with a signal that comes from the nervous system. So the, the good news is when we talk about the nervous system in lesson number 10, it relates really closely to what's going on uh, in, in the muscular system. So just like normal, when we're, um, when we're talking about the nervous system, remember that we had neurons that we called a, oop, that's gonna be too high, a little bit, presynaptic neuron. Remember that we talked about presynaptic neurons as the neurons that send messages. Um, they can send a message to another neuron, which is what we talked about in the nervous system chapter, or they can send a muscle or a message down to a muscle cell. That's what we see on right here. So when we talk about muscle contraction, I have a presynaptic neuron that brings a message. The message is going down to my muscle cells and the message that it's bringing to my muscle cells is it's time to contract. Who remember for me, there's a specific name of the kind of message that neurons release when they're talking to a muscle cell. What's the name of the message that they release when they talk to a muscle cell? Yeah, they release a neurotransmitter. Um, and so the specific neurotransmitter, so we release a neurotransmitter, and the specific neurotransmitter that neurons use to talk to, to muscle cells, somebody chimed in for me, is called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, ACH, yes, as, as we're chiming in now. So the language that neurons speak to muscle fibers is always acetylcholine. This is the only message that, that muscle cells understand, that muscle fibers, fibers understand. So a neurotransmitter brings a message. The message is always, it's time to contract. It sends that message down to my muscle fiber down here. And that message that it releases is acetylcholine. Now I know we're primarily focusing here on how muscles contract but I'm gonna to try to make us make some connections here. Everything that's happening in the neuron down here at this place where they meet called the neuroscular junction, that's a lab word for us, right? Where a neuron meets a muscle cell. Everything that happens right here is the stuff we have to know about the way that neurons talk to each other. So the way that neurons talk to each other, we said that neurons release neurotransmitters, right? There is something that rushes in to my axon terminal. There's a special ion that only comes in in the axon terminal that when that ion comes in to the neuron, it makes the neuron spit out its neurotransmitters. Does anyone remember the name of the special neuron that comes in that makes them spit it out? Yeah, a lot of um, several of us have, have chimed in for me here. At, at the axon terminal, calcium, Calcium, remember, has a, a, a positive two charge. Calcium rushes inside. Here, maybe this looks a little less weird. They both look weird. Calcium rushes into my, my neuron down here. The job of calcium in the axon terminal is to make these little vesicles that are holding acetylcholine make them leave. Because remember, it, it's kind of like when, when that one person comes into the room that you can't stand and you're like, uh-uh, we're done, we're leaving. So calcium comes in to the axon terminal, which makes these vesicles spit out, which is ultimately gonna make my muscle cell contract. 
So the first kind of channels for us to review for, for our neurons, it's calcium channels. They are gated calcium channels. Since they're gated, they are or are not always open. If they're gated, they are or are not. Yes, they are not always open. So they are gated channels. Specifically, the kind of gate that opens up these channels uh, is the type of gate that opens when the membrane charge changes. Yeah, Kelly's chiming in for me. Uh, the specific kind of gated channels that we have down here at, at the axon terminal of my neuron are voltage gated. Voltage gated calcium channels. So that's true whether my neuron is talking to a muscle cell. I've got voltage gated calcium channels. You can see them right here in purple, these little purple things. I have voltage gated calcium channels in the axon terminal whether this neuron is talking to a muscle cell or whether it's talking to its neighbor. Now, one of the things that you guys asked me to cover, and we will cover with a better picture, is the idea of the action potential. And the action potential is when my membrane charge changes from the cell body at the beginning all the way down the axon, all the way to these axon terminals that we're looking at here. So remember that here's my part of my axon that I can see right here. Remember that I changed the membrane charge everywhere on this axon all the way down until I got to my axon terminal. And the reason I had to change its charge in the axon terminal to get it all the way up to positive 30 was because positive 30 is where these channels open up. Voltage gated calcium channels open up when the membrane down here at the axon terminal gets to positive 30. When that gets to positive 30, it spits out neurotransmitters. So keep in mind when we move on and start talking about action potential stuff, all of that stuff applies to this neuron right here. My neuron brings the message. That message is in the form of acetylcholine. The neuron spits out acetylcholine, and acetylcholine goes down. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Goes down and attaches to these little channels down here. Now, these channels are another kind of gated channel, so they are not open. They're gated channels down here. What opens gate is the acetylcholine. So what kind of channels do I see down here? If I use acetylcholine to open these channels, yes. Down here, we've got chemically gated channels. Chemically gated channels. Hey, specifically, these are channels that let in a cation that's going to make my membrane charge go up. Yes, a couple of us are chiming in. These are chemically gated sodium channels. Chemically gated sodium channels. Acetylcholine attaches to these channel proteins on the membrane of my muscle cell. They open up the channel, and what rushes inside the cell is the sodium. I know I had a question, I, and I don't remember if it was because it, in the context of acetylcholine uh, with, with muscles or with nerves, but when we think about what actually goes into a, a muscle cell when it's time for the cell to contract, uh, what actually goes into the cell is sodium. We, we open up the, the sodium channel and sodium rushes inside. Acetylcholine is my little green dots that I see right here, those little tennis balls they don't actually go into the, the muscle cell. They stay on the outside of the muscle cell. They're just the key. What actually gets through my gate is the sodium. Eileen asked uh, what happens to the membrane charge. When I bring in sodium, what happens to the charge on the membrane of this muscle fiber? If I bring in sodium, what happens to its charge? Yes, my, my charge is there. Awesome. We've said it the two possible ways to say it. Either we can say my charge gets more positive, right? Because I'm bringing in a positive ion. Or we can say that it's less negative. Hey, somebody asked about numbers. We do have to know some numbers, right, on, on our muscle cells and our neurons. One of the numbers we need to know on a muscle cell is its resting membrane potential, its normal charge. Yeah. 
Uh, so several of us are chiming in. We're debating here, so let's have a little debate. When we talk about a muscle cell, on my muscle cell is the resting charge negative 70, negative, I'm seeing negative 80, negative 90. When we're doing a, here, let's make a poll really fast. Poll, because I'm getting all the, uh, here I'll put muscle. We, I saw in the chat negative 90, negative 8, negative 70. That's the ones I saw. There might have been some other numbers. Let's let's stick with those. Give me a vote. What is the resting membrane potential on a muscle fiber? Uh, some of us convinced our neighbors we're we're voting more closely together now. <coughs> Excuse me. We we debated it as a class and we landed in the right place. That's good. When I'm talking about a muscle cell. My resting membrane potential, my normal charge on a muscle fiber is negative 90 millivolts, negative 90. And I know you guys said this in the chat, but remind me again, negative 70, which kind of cells have a resting membrane potential of negative 70? Who's negative 70? It's not the muscles. Yes, it's the neurons. Uh, the neurons are going to be going to be my cells that have a resting membrane potential of negative 70. Yeah, so Eileen said, I hope I don't mix them up. Yeah, so we, we just kind of um, need to, to really just memorize those and, and pound those into our mind. Think about muscles just being, muscles are more negative than neurons are to begin with. Um, so muscles are more negative, neurons are a little bit less negative. Um, everything but muscle is negative. I mean, that's, that's generally true, Parker. Yes, Mo the, the average resting membrane potential on cells in your body is negative 70. Um, you can do some reading on the internet and find different things um, for different other specific types of cells, but in general, um, negative 70 is correct, everybody except for muscles. So everybody except for muscles is negative 70. Muscles are negative 90. Um, we had a question about threshold. Um, threshold is not really a thing in muscle cells. Threshold is mostly going to be a thing in neurons. Um, with muscle cells, if they get acetylcholine, as long as there's enough acetylcholine to get these channels open, muscles are going to contract when they get a message. So don't think as much about threshold in the context of a muscle cell. That's really a neuron thing. Um, but do know that both of them start negative. Muscle cells start more negative. They start at negative 90. So I open up these chemically gated sodium channels down here. Sodium rushes inside my cell. It makes my resting membrane potential go up. It makes my membrane charge get higher. Now we used chemically gated channels right here at the place called the neuromuscular junction where the neuron and the muscle cell meet. But this is not the only place on the membrane of my muscle cell that needs to depolarize, that needs to get positive to help me get that membrane charge across the membrane, I'm going to generate an action potential. That's a word we used for neurons and for muscles. Remember when we talked about an action potential, we said this was a membrane charge change, and our emphasis was that moves. A membrane charge change that moves. It's all well and good that the neuromuscular junction, the membrane, freaked out, but I need the whole membrane of the whole cell to freak out. So I need to take get an action potential. I need to change that membrane charge everywhere to, to help me get my whole cell to freak out. So that brings us to our second picture right here. Imagine on this second picture that, that over here is where we saw that neuromuscular junction. So we started over here. We generated an initial spike in membrane charge. We went positive. All along the membrane, all along one of those words we needed to know, the sarcolemma of, of a muscle fiber, all along the sarcolemma, we have a type of gated channel. Again, this gated channel opens in response to charge. What kind of gated channel do I find all across the sarcolemma? 
that helps me to move an action potential. It is a sodium channel. Yep. And it opens in response to charge. What's the name of my special gates that open in response to charge? Yes, voltage gated. Okay, so all along the sarcolemma, I'll make a note here, sarcolemma, we are covered in voltage gated sodium channels. Voltage gated sodium channels. The job of a voltage gated sodium channel is to move the action potential across the membrane. And hey, guess what? Voltage gated sodium channels are the same kind of channels that move the charge across a neuron's membrane. Remember I told you that muscles and neurons, they work the same way. It's, it's the same. So voltage gated sodium channels found all across the sarcolemma. They're helping me to depolarize the membrane everywhere on, on my muscle fiber. Everywhere, including some structures we want to make sure that we know about, called the T-tubules. The T-tubules. Remember from the lab and from our discussion about T-tubules, this is places where I folded the sarcolemma inside. This is going to allow my, my plasma membrane of this cell, the sarcolemma, to, to go all the way down into the very middle of my muscle fiber. So T-tubules are places where I folded the plasma membrane to bring it inside. As I fold this plasma membrane, all of these places, all of these T-tubules are covered in voltage-gated sodium channels. Those voltage-gated sodium channels, when I freak out this part of the membrane, allows me to freak out this part because they, they're, they're opening, they're voltage-gated. And then I have this place where the membrane folds down. So this part starts to change its membrane potential. This part starts to change its potential. We had a question about how we get the calcium channels open. Here, here's the trick. The voltage-gated sodium channel right here uh, that I'm using to change my membrane charge right here, it's literally attached. It's physically attached to my calcium release channels. So the way that calcium gets released is when I push on it. The kind of channels that I have storing my calcium or keeping my calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, these are the ones that open up when I push on them or I physically change their shape. Yes, Ashley's right. I have what are called mechanically gated. Mechanically gated calcium channels. Calcium channels. They are physically attached, so I'll put in parentheses here, attached to, now I'm going to abbreviate here, voltage-gated sodium channels. Voltage-gated sodium channels. So the way I push open this gate is because my voltage-gated sodium channels are attached to it. When the voltage-gated sodium channels open up, because the membrane charge went positive, that changes their shape. Their shape changes, they push on mechanically gated calcium channels and out spits the calcium. Yeah, so Carrie's asking then, the sodium gates, they open because of charge and that ends up pushing on calcium, that's correct. So the sodium channels, our voltage gated sodium channels, they open because of voltage, because of the charge changing. My mechanically gated calcium channels, they open up because I pushed on them uh, somebody asked kind of like a like a one-way gate, kind of like that, yes, where you have to push on it to get it to open up. The way that I push on them is because I changed the shape of a voltage-gated channel. So we changed our membrane charge up here across the sarcolemma. Voltage-gated channels opened up. Voltage-gated sodium channels keep opening up, keep opening up until I see one that's right here. Voltage-gated sodium channel. When this one opens up, it presses on its neighbor mechanically gated calcium channel, which causes all of this calcium to spill out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, Emily, we don't have uh, voltage gated calcium channels in um, the process of muscle contraction. We use voltage gated calcium channels in, in the process of neuron signaling. If you're referring to the ordering activity, cross off the word voltage gated change it to mechanically gated. That was a typo. 
So if you're if you're looking specifically for that particular activity, cross off the voltage gated there. And if I just totally confused you, then ignore what I just said. Um, big picture, I don't use voltage gated calcium channels in muscle contraction. So we went from, let me zoom out. We went from my neuron sending a message that depolarized a little place on the membrane up here at the neuromuscular junction. I then used an action potential to get that signal across the entire membrane, especially down into these T tubules. When it goes down into the T tubules, it helps me to release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in both of, in these places here. Only the reason I need to release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to be able to do the process of muscle contraction, to be able to do uh, what we call the cross bridge cycle. Cross bridge cycle. Let's spell that right. Yeah, Eileen mentioned calcium. I, I like to think that's a, a good way to think about it. Calcium activates the cross bridge cycle or it makes the cross bridge cycle possible. Let's do some review because my picture doesn't show me a lot of details on this. When calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium, these little, little dots down here, it goes down and it attaches to a protein. Which protein in particular, we've got our, our proteins named here, which protein does calcium directly attach to? Yes. Lots of us are, are identifying it. The one that, that calcium directly attaches to is called troponin. Remember, I like to call troponin the pushpin. So I release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It attaches to troponin. It attaches to my pushpin protein. If my pushpin protein changes its shape and it can't push something in anymore, which other protein is then going to slide out of place? If troponin isn't working, who stops working too? What's the protein troponin holds in place? Yes, nice work with your, your fast typing, guys. I'm impressed. Tropomyosin is a long, long protein name there. So tropomyosin, we called this one in, in our discussion of, of muscle fiber the wet spaghetti noodle. If the push pin changes shape because calcium attached to it, the wet spaghetti noodle falls out of place. And when tropomyosin, that wet spaghetti noodle, falls out of place, now, my actin protein, which is the main protein I find in the thin filament of, of arcomere, is actin. Now that I don't have this wet spaghetti noodle wrapping around anymore, I have spaces on actin where myosin can attach to. So for the cross bridge cycle to work, because I use myosin to attach to actin, I need to have spots available on actin for myosin to be able to attach to it. So when we say that calcium activates or allows the cross bridge cycle to start, big picture, that's how it works. Calcium comes and attaches to my push pin, which lets the spaghetti noodle move, which opens up a space on actin so that myosin can attach. Let me see, because somebody did ask me to briefly talk about the cross bridge cycle. Let me pull up these pictures really fast. Help me out here. Which page of the note packet do we find the cross bridge cycle, the stages of the cross bridge cycle? What page is this one on? I may be seeing page five of the lecture packet, page five. Yeah, okay. We want to make sure as we're preparing for the exam that we know what happens in each of these stages of, of the cross bridge cycle. So. As we're going here through here and we're looking at the stages, um, first thing just to familiarize yourself with, and you've got it written in bold and you've got it kind of underlined on your sheet, is the name of each of these stages. So do make sure we're familiar with the names. Um, remember, this is not a fill in the blank test, so I'm not going to ever ask you to write names of the stages, but we want to understand what's happening in each of them. So here's where I'm going to kind of um, I'm going to put the work out to the class here. You're going to help me out with, with figuring out what's going on in each of these stages. The first stage is called cross bridge formation. Cross bridge formation. In the chat, tell me 
what what are some of the things that you say happen in the crossbridge formation stage? What's happening in crossbridge formation? My first step of the crossbridge cycle. I love it. Yep. So the biggest thing that happens here in crossbridge formation, myosin attaches to actin. Short, sweet, simple. Myosin attaches to actin. Um, I'll mention, Eileen, that actually calcium had to attach to troponin way before this, this happened. If calcium didn't hadn't already attached to troponin, then we, we couldn't do any of this process. So think about calcium attaching even before we can go into the crossbridge cycle at all. If I, if I don't have calcium, I can't do any of this. Um, so it, it, it's a good thought. I'm just mentioning that to say that, that we, that's kind of a, a prerequisite, if you will. We got to have that done. Otherwise we can't do the cross bridge cycle. You can see the little calcium though. That's the nice thing about this picture. I can see the little calcium attached to my troponin. So that helps me already happened. So big picture when we talk cross bridge formation, the, the really the only thing that we care about that, that happens in cross bridge formation stage, myosin attaches to actin. That's what's going to occur in this stage. Stage number two is called the power stroke. The power stroke. I can think of a couple of different things that happen here in the power stroke stage. What are some of the things that you would say happens in the power stroke stage? Okay, so Pilar got one of them for me. Myosin, uh, myosin releases ADP. Uh, so here we'll put myosin. I'm going to I'm going to get get not technical at all with you here spits out Just because that's going to help me remember it better spits out ADP That's one thing that happens. Yeah, and that inorganic phosphate. Yep And then the other thing that happens is myosin pulls on actin <coughs> Excuse me these are the two specific things that happen in the power stroke. If we went big picture though, we could kind of um, summarize both of these things, these two things that are happening here. If we wanted to put it in one phrase, you could, could say that what happens in this stage is myosin changes shape. Myosin changes shape. Because first myosin has to let go of this low energy ADP. We see it spitting it out over here. It spits out some stuff that it had attached over here in stage one, spits that stuff out. When it spits that stuff out, that allows the myosin go for, to go from a straight up position to this bent over position that we see here. When myosin bends over, it pulls on actin. You can see the little line right here. We're pulling on actin, pulling it toward, as somebody mentioned, toward the M line. We're making actin slip past myosin. So the two things that happen, number one, we got to get rid of that dead weight, the no energy, that's ADP. Number two, when I get rid of that, I can change my shape, and that allows me to pull on actin. So one of the stages where myosin changes its shape is this working stroke right here, the power stroke, if you will. This is where the muscle actually gets shorter. This is where myosin and actin slide past each other. Then we move down here into step three. Step three is called cross bridge detachment. I again can think of a couple of things that we could say happen in step three here. What are those, those two things that, that happen in step three? Any ideas? What's going on in cross bridge detachment? Yep, myosin and actin let go. They, they detach, right? So myosin and actin, here we'll, we'll put it again in, in not technical words at all. They split up. It's just not working for them. They can't, they can't do this anymore. Myosin and actin split up. The reason they split up, like a couple of us identified in the chat, is because myosin attaches to ATP. Myosin attaches to ATP. Both of these two things that we say are, are happening here in the cross bridge detachment stage, we want to make sure that we know that both of these happen here. Really, it's the attachment to ATP that happens first that allows myosin and actin to not be attached anymore. So if we put them in order, technically a molecule of ATP comes and attaches to myosin. 
when it attaches to myosin, like Ariel mentioned for us, then myosin changes its shape again. So we'll put another note. Myosin changes shape again. It happened again. This time when myosin changed its shape, now it's no longer attached to actin. So myosin and actin not attached to each other anymore. This is the cross bridge detachment or when they're not attached anymore stage right here, stage three. The last stage of the cross bridge cell is what we call cocking the myosin head or getting the myosin head ready to attach to ATP again, or excuse me, to actin again, sorry. The way that I, that I make this happen is, yeah, as Carrie mentioned for us, and it's written right here on our picture, ATP hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is just a fancy word for I broke up the ATP. So that ATP that came down and attached to my, act, my myosin down here that allowed me to not hold on to actin, if I chop that up, if I turn it into ADP that has no more energy, I can steal that energy to go from being in this, this bent down position to go back into what we call the cocked position or the upright position. Because I have to be in the upright position to be able to go all the way back here and attach to actin again. So the four stages of the cross bridge cycle, we do want to make sure we know what's happening in each of them from when myosin and actin attach to each other to when myosin and actin slide past each other to when they detach from each other over to uh, when we get ready to start the process over again. So we've talked about muscle contraction from getting the signal from the neuron all the way down to how contraction actually works. Um, let me open the floor for some questions. I got a question from Pilar about what hydrolysis technically means. Um, if you want to get technical on what it means, it means um, using water to break something. Using water to break something. If you remember back from when we talked about protein synthesis, we when we're building proteins, we used a process called dehydration synthesis. Oh, it would help if I had my H in there. Dehydration synthesis. That's when I removed water to build something. These guys are opposites of each other. So hydrolysis is just the opposite of dehydration synthesis. So hydro ATP hydrolysis means that what I did to get these to split up, somebody got a hydrogen and somebody got an, an OH group. I used water to break something. That's what it technically means. What other questions do we have about muscles? Or give me a thumbs up or my daily dancing emoji, if I've earned the dancing emoji. How do we feel about muscles? I got one friend dancing. Some of us are maybe still typing questions. Oh, we got a, we got a flash mob going on right now. Look at that. I like it. Okay. Well, if you think of a question a little bit later and um, we've moved on, feel free to pop it into the chat. I may not answer it in real time, um, but I will definitely try to answer it for you. Um, I'm going to move us on to neurons. Would you say if there were no T-tubules, there'd be no contraction? Um, I Yes, probably. Um, T-tubules are needed to get the entire muscle cell to contract. So, yeah, kind of like Carrie said, we, if we don't have T-tubules, the, the myofibrils in the middle of the muscle cell would never get the message to contract. So, um, ultimately, I'd probably say yes. If my muscle fiber didn't have T-tubules, there, um, th there would not be muscle contraction in the entire cell. Um, Kelly briefly mentioned a question about fast oxidative fibers. Um, yeah, if you want to type it into the chat for me really fast, Kelly, or if you want to go on mic really fast and, and um, mention that question, we can cover that that quickly. I'll go to 
I mean, I don't have a lot of good pictures, right? I have a lot of pictures. Uh, fast oxidative, they they use glycogen, but um, let me go. I lost the question there. They use glycogen, but are part of the electron transport chain. Um, for so um, for the sake of our class, we're going to assume that if it has the word oxidative in its name, um, it just uses the electron transport chain. If we get very technical, technically yes, a fast oxidative fiber at the very beginning uses a little bit of glycogen to get started, but it, its, primar its primary energy source is going to be the electron transport chain. Um, so yeah, so for the sake uh, of our class, the way that we're learning muscles, just focus on the fact we called it fast oxidative. Um, focus on this oxidative part here. When, I, when I'm asking you on the exam, who uses the electron transport chain? We're going with the fact that, that this one has oxidative in its name. It uses the electron transport chain. If I ask you on the exam who uses glycogen, we are going to say that that's my fast glycolytic. We're going to look at the words in their names. Um, yes, so glycolysis, glycolysis and Krebs cycle, yes, that's where it, it ties into. Wow, I totally spelled glycolytic wrong. All good. And we talked about this. Gosh, this was um, this was our first week online, right? Back when we didn't know what we were doing yet, we were still learning. Um, so that's going to be probably the third office hours that I did with you guys if you want a little more information about those types of muscle fibers. Okay, let's switch gears. We're going to go to neurons. So we're going to go to lesson number 10 now. Let me find the picture that I want to start with here. Let's do, well here, let's start with this one. Obviously there's not a lot of information on this picture, but we're going to fill it in together or fill in some of it together. So help me out. We are in lesson number 10 packet now, lesson number 10. Can anyone tell me what page we've got this picture of the neuron? Okay, I'm here on page 12. Okay. Um, so we're in lesson number 10 now, page 12. The goal, there are two goals of, of this particular image. Uh, the two goals of this image are for us to know the, the structures that I find on my neurons and also for me to know the types of channels that I have places. We're going to use this simple picture to talk about um, where I have the channels based on the way that neuron signaling works. So we're going to like work the life out of this picture here. We're going to get a whole bunch of information here. I'm not going to label it or mine because it's going to take me too long. But let's do some review together here to remind ourselves of parts. When I talk about the process of neuron signaling, it all starts here with these little guys up here. What are these little branching structures called that I have on the neuron? Yes, uh, we're chiming in. These out here on the outside that reach out of my neuron are called the dendrites. Absolutely. So the dendrites, if we were to summarize their functions, my dendrites can't spell them. Dendrite's job is to receive messages. Exactly, Gloria. They're, they're receiving my signals. Okay. So dendrites receive messages. And hey, the messages that they receive are exactly the same as what my muscle fibers received. What was the name of the kind of messages that neurons receive? Yeah, there's that big word coming back, right? They receive neurotransmitters. They receive neurotransmitters. Just like when we talked about a neurotransmitter going to a muscle cell, when neurotransmitters go to a neuron, when a, a neurotransmitter goes and attaches to a, a neuron down here, we are again talking about chemically gated channels because these are a type of chemical. So when I talk about the kinds of ion channels that I have available on a neuron out here, I'm talking about chemically gated channels that I find on the dendrites. Remember from our discussion that there are three kinds of chemically gated channels that we use in, in a neuron. We've got the chemically gated chloride channels, chemically gated sodium channels, chemically gated potassium channels. Hey, by the way, 
I got some questions about this on the homework. I threw in a distractor answer for you on the homework assignment for this one. Chemically gated calcium channels. Hey, guess what kind of channels do not exist? Chemically gated calcium channels. When you're taking the exam, uh, today, tomorrow, Friday, whenever you take the exam, we don't have chemically gated calcium channels. We didn't talk about chemically gated calcium channels. Um, so don't tell me that I've got chemically gated calcium channels out here because I don't. They, they probably exist on some cell, type of cell. I can't say they don't exist anywhere in the body, um, but I can tell you 100% confidently they don't exist out here and they don't anywhere on a neuron. So take your time reading slowly. We do have chemically gated chloride channels. We do have chemically gated sodium channels. We do have chemically gated potassium channels. When I open these different channels, remember that they don't let the neurotransmitters inside, let these ions inside. When these ions come inside at the dendrites, go into the cell body in here, they're going to generate for me the things that we talked about last week, EPSPs and IPSPs. EPSPs and IPSPs. Now I promise you, like I did on the homework, it's gonna be the same way on the exam. I will give you the full word or the full spelling out for you of what that stands for. And EPSP, what does that E word stand for? That's the only one I'll make you type for me. What does E stand for? Yes, yeah, so E stands for excitatory, excitatory. So an EPSP is an excitatory message. Remember from, from your studying that we said that neurons are excitable cells, which means that they use a change in their charge to get things done, to send messages. An excitatory message that they receive is going to be a message that makes their membrane charge get more positive, excitatory messages. What about these IPSPs? What does I stand for? IPSPs. Yeah, that word I means it's an inhibitory message, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. With these inhibitory messages, their job is to try to tell this neuron, hey, you, you need to not talk to your neighbor. Because remember, there's two things the neurons do. Either they get excited and they talk to their neighbor, or they get less excited and they, they keep a secret. They're not talking. So if I send an inhibitory message, I send a neurotransmitter that, that makes my membrane charge get more NIV, then this neuron is not going to fire. It's not going to send a message. So what have we talked about so far? Dendrites that I find on my neuron. They're covered in these chemically gated channels. These chemically gated channels open up to either let in ions that ha generate an excitatory change in my charge or an inhibitory change in my charge. I should have should have typed this way back when I when I had my lines lined up there. When we talk about an EPSP or an excitatory change in the membrane charge, remind me, does that mean the membrane got more positive or more negative? With an EPSP, my membrane charge got more, yeah, most of us agree, my membrane charge got more positive. An excitatory message makes me more positive. The way that my membrane charge gets more positive is something comes inside from my ion channels. I'm not going to click away because I'll lose my space here. You got those three types of ion channels, chloride, sodium, potassium. Which of those types of ion channels, when I open up, let something inside that makes me positive? Yeah, we've got several of us chiming in here. What makes me positive is sodium. When sodium comes inside, when sodium comes inside, it brings with it its positive charge. I guess I, I don't have sodium's positive charge anywhere. Here we go. Na plus. When sodium comes inside, it brings its positive charge with it. 
that positive charge makes my membrane charge more positive, makes me as a neuron more excited or ready to talk to my neighbor, I have generated an EPSP. So my chemically gated sodium channel opened up, let a bunch of sodium inside. That sodium made my membrane charge more positive. But sometimes a neurotransmitter does not attach to a chemically gated sodium channel. Sometimes my neurotransmitter is going to attach to a chemically gated potassium channel or a chemically gated chloride channel. When I open up either of these kinds of channels, I generate an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Did my membrane charge get more positive or more negative with inhibitory? Yes, lots of us chiming in. My membrane charge got more negative. It went down lower. Inhibitory means I'm trying to get you to not talk to your neighbor. And if you're going to talk to your neighbor, your membrane charge has to go up. So an inhibitory postsynaptic potential brings the membrane charge down. It's inhibiting things. I don't have time to go into this today, but please make a note for yourself to remind yourself, we got to look at that salty banana because that salty banana is going to help you understand how opening up channels for potassium and for chloride these two things, they actually move opposite directions, which is what allows both of them to have an inhibitory effect. So especially if you weren't in office hours that day, we got to put think about this in the context of a salty banana to help us understand how these two things, how both of them can make my charge more negative. Okay, what we've talked about so far in the process of neuron signaling, my dendrites here on the outside. My dendrites are covered in these chemically gated channels. These chemically gated channels open up when a neurotransmitter attaches to them. I am constantly receiving all kinds of neurotransmitters, so I'm constantly making all of these little tiny changes in my membrane charge. But my neuron, my cell body here, as well as this part right here called the axon hillock, these parts of my neuron are here let's use a functional word here they are integrating or they are processing all of these messages there's a special name that we use to describe when my neurons add together messages what did we call it when the neurons added together messages what's that called yes a bunch of us are chiming in the way that my neuron adds together those messages to see where we're at it's called summation summation. I am not going to have time today to go through and talk about summation, but I know we hit it hard in office hours last week. So if you didn't get a chance to, to attend that office hours, we got a good recording that talks all about the process of summation. Basically how summation works is I add together all of my positive messages and I add together all of my negative messages and I see what happens to my membrane charge because there's a special membrane charge that I have to reach, a special number I have to reach to be able to talk to my neighbors. What is the name, before we do the number, what is the name of that value that I've got to hit for me to be able to send a message? Yes, several of us are chiming in. Uh, if a neuron sends a message, it's membrane, charge hit threshold threshold that is a term we must know underline highlight stars threshold now before we do the number of threshold we need to remind ourselves resting membrane potential on a neuron we said this earlier today what's the resting membrane potential on a neuron Yep, there we go, negative 70. My neurons are normal, like most of the other cells in the body, negative 70, okay? This is normal. Threshold value is, is different enough from normal that it's going to allow me to depolarize membrane. 
what is the threshold value number? What's the next number I made you learn? Yep, negative 55. Negative 55. Normally, my neuron is at negative 70. If we get enough excitatory messages, enough positive messages to get all the way up to negative 55, that tells my neuron it's time for us to do an action potential. It's time for us to send a message. The place in my neuron where hitting threshold is so important, where it matters the most, is this little region right here. What did I call this region right here? This little triangle space here. Ooh. Yeah, I got a couple of us. This little triangle region right here is called the axon hillock. Let's make sure we know that one for lab. The axon hillock. It's the place where the axon, the big extension here, attaches to the cell body of the neuron. The axon hillock is the primary place where we do this summation stuff, where I add together the positives and the negatives. Here at the axon hillock. Because the axon hillock has a new type of ion channels, it has a type of ion channels that are sensitive to charge. Yeah, so Ashley's chiming in. The axon hillock is the first place on my neuron where I see voltage-gated channels, voltage-gated channels. Now, I see two kinds of voltage-gated channels here, two kinds of voltage-gated. The first kind that I see are the kind that I use to depolarize my membrane, to make my membrane more positive. Which of those ones listed, so we'll go back over to our list here, calcium, potassium, sodium, who makes me more positive? Voltage gated, lots of us are chiming in, sodium, that's correct. Voltage gated sodium makes me, depolarizes, we'll put our technical word here, depolarize. Voltage gated sodium channels are the first kind that I find here. Their job here is to depolarize the membrane. If I get to negative 55 at the axon hillock, voltage-gated sodium channels open up. That allows sodium to inside with its positive charge, and that depolarizes my membrane. Now, I need to depolarize the axon hillock because that's going to help me to depolarize the axon, next door neighbor to it. And that's going to help me to depolarize the next part of the axon and the next part, all the way down from the axon hillock to the very ends of my neurons, I have voltage channels everywhere. Because remember, an action potential is a change in charge that moves. So starting at the axon hillock, going everywhere else down this neuron, we have voltage-gated sodium channels. Their job is always to depolarize the membrane. But once I freaked out my membrane charge, all the way up to positive 30, I can't stay there. I need to get back to normal. Getting back to normal is the job of another kind of voltage-gated channel. What's the other kind of voltage-gated channel that's here? Yes, voltage-gated potassium. Voltage-gated potassium. I use voltage-gated potassium channels to repolarize the membrane to get it back to normal. So voltage-gated sodium channels open first. They rush in a bunch of sodium. That makes me positive. But when I get really positive, then I open up voltage-gated potassium channels to spit out a bunch of potassium to get me back to negative. Starting at this point, yes, yeah, so Eileen asked, are we still talking about the axon hillock? Yes, we, we're here at the axon hillock. We got both of these things there. They start here, and they extend all the way down the axon. Because remember, we're moving that action potential. We're, we're moving our signal all the way down. And the way that I move that signal is with sodium and potassium. I move it all the way down, all the way to these little guys down here. What do these little circles represent? What are the names of these little circles? There's a couple of different things I can call them. What do I call these little circles? Yeah, so this is where the synapse would be, specifically when we're talking about the part of the neuron that I see at the synapse. The two things I can call it. The thing we called it in the lab packet was the synaptic bulb. Synaptic bulb. 
or what I like to call them, like a couple of us chimed in in the chat there, I like to call them the axon terminals. I just like that, that better because it relates it to the axon. They're the same thing when we're talking about these parts of my neuron here. Voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels. We see them in the axon hillock. We see them all the way down the axon. We see them all the way down to the synaptic bulbs or all the way down to the axon terminals because I have to move that action potential everywhere. It's, it's got to go all the way across the membrane here to the very end of the road, that which is the end of the road is the axon terminals. When I hit the end of the road, there is that special type of channel that a couple of us are mentioning in the chat. That last special kind of channel that I see on a neuron is the one that we actually talked about back with, with muscle contraction, the voltage-gated calcium channels. Voltage-gated calcium channels. The only place on a neuron that I find voltage-gated calcium channels is at the very end of the road. It's at those axon terminals or it's at those synaptic bulbs because the job, remember, the job of a voltage-gated calcium channel is to bring in a bunch of calcium to spit out neurotransmitters. The only place on this entire neuron where I spit out neurotransmitters is at the very end of the road is at the axon terminals or the places we call the synaptic bulb. So when you're studying the neuron, we want to make sure that we know where each of these types of channels are. Generally speaking, if we want to say a biggest picture term, chemically gated stuff only at the dendrites. Voltage gated stuff starts in the axon hillock, goes all the way down but those voltage-gated calcium channels only at the axon terminals. That's the only place that I find those ones. Um, Eileen asks, so is this where hyperpolarization happens? Hyperpolarization happens everywhere that I have voltage-gated channels, everywhere that I have voltage-gated potassium channels. Uh, so the first place on the membrane we would see that would get hyperpolarized is up here at the axon hillock. Um, help me out. Let's see if, if we remember this from our studying. What causes, what kind of channel is responsible for the voltage gate, or excuse me, I was about to give you the answer there, for hyperpolarization? Which, which kind of, of ion channel does hyperpolarization? Yes. Yep. So we're all chiming in. My type of channel that does hyperpolarization is this one right here. Voltage gated potassium channels. Voltage gated potassium channels don't close quickly enough. So, any place on the membrane where I use them to repolarize the membrane, get the membrane charge back down, anywhere that I, that I use them, which is everywhere, to get my membrane charge back down, I will always hyperpolarize the membrane. Um, so, starting in the axon hillock, the axon hillock will get hyperpolarized. It'll eventually leak itself back to normal and, and get there over time. This section of my axon will hyperpolarize itself as well because, again, the voltage-gated potassium channels don't close fast enough. Even down here at the axon terminals, they'll hyperpolarize themselves too. It's just because everywhere I use a voltage-gated potassium channel, they don't close fast enough. So that happens everywhere. The entire graph happens everywhere uh, across the membrane. Got the question, if hyperpolarizing and repolarizing is the same thing, um, yeah, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, repolarizing, it's done by the same channel. So let's let's start with that qualifier here. Let me bounce to, to a graph just to show you on a graph. We would say that repolarizing, the process of repolarizing, is what I see happening over here as my charge goes back to normal repolarizing. This is what happens from positive 30 all the way down to when I get to negative 70 millivolts. But the problem is I don't stop getting negative at, at negative 70 millivolts. Hyperpolarized, as a couple of us said in the chat, is anything below negative 70. So once I hit negative 70 right about here, 
as I go down into this dip where I get more negative, when I am more negative than negative 70, now I'm hyperpolarized. Now the same, it, it, the way that I repolarize the membrane is technically the same way that I hyperpolarize it. I repolarize on purpose though. Hyperpolarizing happens by accident. It's just because I, I can't close the gates fast enough. Um, yes, so it does always get hyperpolarized because those channels are really bad at closing. So every time I, uh, now let's qualify that, on a neuron, every time I repolarize, we always hyperpolarize. Um, on muscles, they're a little bit better, um, but on neurons, every time I, I repolarize the membrane, I always do this thing, uh, they call it undershoot, undershoot, where I get too negative. That always happens. So um, it, it's all caused by the same kind of channel, doing the same kind of thing. When I get too negative, that's when I call it hyperpolarized. And yes, a couple of us are chiming in for Emily's question, where do I release the neurotransmitters? The neurotransmitters is the only place on this graph that I would be releasing neurotransmitters up here at the very top. When, when our membrane charge is positive 30, when I'm up here at positive 30, which kind of channels did we say we opened to help us release neurotransmitters? Who uh, who opens to help me release? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the calcium channels, right? It's the voltage-gated calcium. Voltage-gated calcium channels. They open up here at positive 30 to help me release my neurotransmitters. But again, remind me, because I'm forgetful, there's only one place on a neuron that's got voltage-gated calcium channels. Who's got those voltage-gated calcium channels? Which part of that neuron has it? Yes, the end of the line, the axon terminals. Everywhere else on my neuron, the only thing that happens up here, uh, we talked about this during office hours, if I'm not at an axon terminal, all I would say about what happens here at the top of my graph is we would just say neuron is completely depolarized. If I'm in the axon, the axon is not gonna spit out neurotransmitters only the axon terminal is gonna spit out neurotransmitters. So the only place that positive 30 means that neurotransmitters go out is the axon terminal. Um, otherwise, this is as high of a, a membrane charge as we'll let ourselves get to before we start going through and repolarizing the membrane. Um, question on the homework about the channels. Um, in the axon terminal, uh, was ask, asking something about voltage-gated chloride channels. We didn't talk at all about voltage-gated chloride channels. So just like we had the distractor answer that was a chemically gated calcium channel, we didn't talk about those. We also didn't talk about voltage-gated chloride channels because, again, on a neuron, those don't exist. Um, so if you selected voltage-gated calcium chloride channels, it took away credit for you. Here, here's just a heads up for you guys because I've gotten several questions about um, when you have a question that says select all that apply and then it tells you to not select any that that don't apply I'm gonna lose that those words there not select there are two ways to lose credit on those questions first way is if you're missing a correct answer if something's not there that should be there second way you lose credit is you picked wrong answers so on that question where, where I'm asking you about ion channels, if you told me at the axon terminal that we've got voltage-gated chloride channels, you picked a wrong answer, and that's why you didn't get full credit. Um, if you did not pick voltage-gated calcium channels, for example, um, that means you're missing a correct answer, and that's why you didn't get full credit. So um, with those kinds of questions, keep in mind, I've, I've given you the, the hint, tell me all the ones that are correct, but don't give me something that's wrong because you'll lose credit for that or you'll be you'll be missing a correct answer. I know we don't like those questions, but you know what? They make you keep doing the homework assignment until you get credit. So think about that. Um, we want to find all of the right answers, but not the wrong answers. Yeah, they do. Eileen said they do. They make me keep working on it and keep thinking. So next time you're working on that kind of question, 
Remember, if you didn't get full credit, either it means you're missing a right answer or you pick something that's wrong. There's there's two ways. Um, so I, it's hard to say, Martha, what happened with that if you accidentally clicked chemically gated. Um, chemically gated is incorrect. It had to be all voltage gated. Uh, it's hard to know. And um, again, that's why we've got unlimited attempts on the homework assignment. If something went funky with one attempt, just try it again. Um, the other thing I'll mention too, because I got questions about these channels, I didn't just ask you about the uh, the types of channels that I found at the Axon terminals. Sometimes I ask you about what I found at the Axon terminals. Sometimes I ask you about what I found at the Axon. Sometimes I ask you about what I found at the dendrites. If you kept answering the question about the Axon terminals, but your homework assignment had moved on to asking you about the dendrites, you're not going to get credit for that. So all that to say, please, please read your questions slowly when you take the exam, because I promise you there's like four versions of every single question. It's not the same. It's the same thing with the homework. You never get the same homework assignment twice. So please read your questions slowly. If you were telling me the type of channels that I found on the dendrites, but your question was asking you about the axon or the axon hillock, tough luck because none of your answers are going to be right. So please read slowly. Um, please be careful. Mary Lou asked about the chemically gated. Yeah, so um, asked where we find those chemically gated channels. And, and Carrie's absolutely right. The place, where, the only place where I find chemically gated channels is on the dendrites. Because think about their names. Uh, chemically gated means I need a chemical to open them. Uh, asking about where they'd be on the graph. Let's go to our graph where you're labeling your types of channels. Um, help me out in the chat. If you were to number the these lines here from left to right, so number one, well, let's add some numbers. Number one, number two, three, four, five, six. Help me out. Um, which of those numbers on my graph are where I see chemically gated channels involved? Where's those chemically gated ones? Okay, a lot of us agree chemically gated channels are here at the beginning. Chemically gated channels are what I use to do the process of summation, what I use to receive messages. So chemically gated channels are what I use here at the beginning. At this point, yeah, as Carrie mentioned, this is threshold. Once I hit threshold, that's that charge, negative 55, where I am committed to, to depolarizing my membrane. So this would be the point on my graph where I first open up voltage-gated sodium channels, number two right here. Which kind of channels are open here at number three? Yep, this is still voltage-gated sodium right here. So they open at number two. They stay open all the way through number three. Up here at number four, let's pretend that I am at the axon terminal. I'm at my, my synaptic bulb. What kind of channels would open up here if I'm at an axon terminal? Yeah, those calcium ones, right? If I'm at an axon terminal, voltage-gated calcium channels open here. If I am not at an axon terminal, and I just need to start the process of coming back down, who opens up here when I just need to repolarize? Yeah, my voltage gated potassium. So two kinds of channels that could open up here. At what opens up here everywhere, every time, is voltage gated potassium channels to help me get back down. If I'm at the axon terminal, voltage gated calcium channels open here. Regardless of whether I'm at the axon terminal or anywhere else, number five here is where I see those voltage gated potassium channels spitting out that potassium, spitting out that potassium, and then, oops, I spit out too much potassium. Slowly over time, I'm gonna get back to normal thanks to which kind of channel? What kind of channel gets me back to normal here at number six? Yeah, so it's my leakage channels down here that are gonna get me from hyperpolarized back up to normal. I use leakage channels, and I use something way back from lesson number four called the sodium-potassium pump. Those two things work together 
But for the sake of, of our exam, we're focusing on the leakage channels that are, are working together on that. We're talking about this one down here, number six. Emily, we're talking about number six down there. So there's a question. So are the chemically gated channels used at all in the hyperpolarization process? Let me put that question to the class. Do I use chemically gated channels in hyperpolarization? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in. The only time I use chemically gated channels, um, here's a note maybe to write for myself. The only time I use chemically gated channels is when I'm talking about summation. The only time I use chemically gated channels because that's the only time on this graph where there's chemicals involved. The only time on my graph where there's chemicals or neurotransmitters involved is here at the beginning. Once I hit threshold, everything else that happens in a neuron is all about voltage. It has nothing to do with chemicals anymore. It's all about voltage. So the only place I use chemically gated channels here at the very beginning, when I get those messages, once I hit threshold, it's all about voltage that takes over at that point. Uh, so Mary Lou's asking, so at the stimulus point, a neurotransmitter is received. That's correct. Yes. So if you go back to that very first version of this graph where it has some words on, on what's happening, um, at, at the very beginning here, this is where I receive a neurotransmitter from a neighbor. Um, and then up here at the top is where I would send a neurotransmitter on to my neighbor. Yes. So I received one down here at the bottom, I sent one up here at the top. That's correct. We killed two birds with one stone there. Two of the things we talked about was the action potential that was on our list. And we talked about those channels on a neuron. The other thing I have on my list here to talk about is our three types of neurons. Before I move on to that, do we have any last minute questions about this stuff? Or let's see if we can build another flash mob. We got some more dancing emojis that, that we get this morning. Here, I'll give you guys your daily penguin. Let's draw our daily penguin while we think of any other last minute questions about this stuff. You guys can build me some, some dancing emojis. I'll draw you a little penguin here. Anything we can do to have community, right? Like we can't be together, but at least we can pretend to dance together. I can draw you penguins. You can give me penguins and dancing people. Got to do what you got to do on quarantine, right? So. <clears throat> okay. Ooh, fist bump. I like it. I am teaching my three-year-old how to do air fist bumps. So that's pretty fun. Um, across the room. That's fun. Yeah, we want to make the penguin green today. That's what I did when I was, I told some people that were still around when I was in high school, I, uh, I was a nerd. Well, you already guessed that, I'm sure. Um, but I was the nerd that liked to draw green penguins. And this is actually like the color that I would draw. So here's your little green penguin for you. I know, I'm getting better and better at drawing them on the computer. Man, in real life, you should see them. They're pretty legit. So, okay. Um, yes, so Kathleen, you mentioned the, the primary and the association. I can definitely talk about that. Primary versus association. Let me add that. Versus association. Uh, Pilar asked about basically what the role of chemically gated channels are. Um, is, the, is, is it just to allow the binding of neurotransmitters? That is correct. I like that, Parker. Blue dancing for us. That's awesome. Um, yeah, to answer your question, Pilar, that's correct. Um, all I use chemically gated channels for here at the very beginning is they, they're looking for a chemical key. When that chemical key binds to them, that, that's all I use them for. That's, that's totally correct. Okay, so let's talk about functional types of neurons, and then we'll bump into a couple of things in number 11. Oh, here, by the way, I don't know how many of us actually got to see this meme because it, it, it came through late. Um, here, here's a meme that I think a lot of us missed because I, I didn't do a good job getting it up the day that we were talking about this in class. Anybody like that meme? I thought that one was pretty good. 
I was happy with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what's great too is like, you know, now you can do meme generators and like make him say whatever you want. So I didn't, I didn't build that one. I built the Botox one that, that you guys had in, um, in your packet. I didn't build this one, but I was, I was pretty happy with that one. So I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we'll take a pass on the, the Corona. He's not the Corona guy. So we're good. <laughs> yeah. Easy to remember. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, easy to remember for the exam. So that's, that's perfect. Okay. Um, one of the things we wanted to briefly touch on, so I'm going to pull up a picture. Is this, uh, I'm going to guess page two of, of number 10. That's my guess. It may or may not be right. What page do you have this picture in the description on there? Yeah, page two. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let's briefly talk then about our, our types of neurons and kind of use it to make predictions. Um, so this is lab view for you. So you can totally pull out the lab packet too that supplements when we first talked about nervous system. Remember that there are three types of neurons that we have in the body. Um, so the first type of neurons that we have here and, and their name just comes directly from what they do are just called those sensorons. If you were to describe for me in some easy words what sensory neurons do, what are some of the words that we would say sensory neurons do? Yeah, I like the word collect. That's a good one. Collects information. Um, collects here, if we want to use a technical word for information, um, the technical word for information, we could call it stimuli. If you see that word popping up, stimuli is just a way for saying sensory information. It's what's happening in your environment. So a sensory neuron is my, my collecting neurons. All they do is collect information. They don't do any um, figuring out what it means. They do nothing with that information. They just collect it. My types of neurons here that I find in the middle that are doing integration. Does anyone remember what we call these green neurons right here? What are the, which type of neurons is my second, second classification of neurons in here? Yeah, these are called my interneurons interneurons and it's easy to remember their name when you use the technical word for what their job is the technical word for their job is integration but what are some easy words for what integration means how could we put that in a simpler word yeah determine what action or solution is needed processing absolutely so processing or sometimes, uh, to summarize what, what Gloria mentioned for us here, with, with the processing, um, I also sometimes like to use the word it. Yeah, like a couple of us are chiming in now. Processing the stimuli, so let's add that word back there, and predicting the response. Predicting. Processing and predicting. Um, that's basically what this anatomy word integration means. So my sensory neurons collect information. They do nothing with this, this information. They just collect it and they funnel it back to their friends called interneurons. Interneurons are the ones that do the processing and predicting. They figure out how we should respond. When they figured out how we should respond, they send that information out through motor neurons. Motor neurons. When we talk about motor neurons, what would be a way for us to describe what a motor neuron does? Yeah, exactly. They're the ones that perform the action. Uh, they make, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize, I'll call it, make movements happen. It's generally, when we're talking, the stuff we're talking about in our class is generally going to be movements. Um, it, it can also be, when you guys get to AMP2, some of the kinds of things that they, they make happen too. Um, just as a teaser for you, they can also make uh, organs spit out um, hormones. Motor neurons can make hormones get released as well. Uh, but for our class, we're, we're primarily focusing on these guys with movements. So motor neurons make movements happen. They make actions happen. Remember that the interneurons figured out what we should be doing. The motor neurons are the ones that actually make it happen. Uh, we had a question about whether or not we should know that the interneurons live in the central nervous system. You should know that for lab. 
Um, for the sake of lecture, I'm not going to get that specific and ask you a question that relies on you knowing that. So generally speaking, my, my processing and predicting neurons, yes, the place that they live, they're going to live either in uh, the brain or they're going to live in the spinal cord that extends down. Uh, terminology review, again, a lot from lab, although we did it a little bit in lecture. Your body has the central nervous system and it has what's called the peripheral nervous system. Yeah, I should have just abbreviated it. Actually typed it way faster. The central nervous system just has two parts. What are the two things that are in the central nervous system? Just two things in your entire body that are central nervous system. Exactly. Yep, first one is the brain. Second one is the cord. So everything that attaches to the brain and the spinal cord, um, which includes what we're going to talk about tomorrow in office hours, those cranial nerves, which includes what we'll talk about next week in lab, which is the spinal nerves. Um, anything that's not the brain and the spinal cord, that's all considered peripheral nervous system. So integration, processing, figuring out what we should be doing, that happens in the brain and the spinal cord. Culling information from the environment or making movements happen, that has to do with the peripheral nervous system. Um, yes, yeah, Ashley mentions the cerebrospinal fluid. Yep, around the brain and the spinal cord, we got that cerebrospinal fluid that we talked about in lesson 11, absolutely. So that, that surrounds our, our central nervous system because the peripheral nervous system leaves the area right by the brain and the spinal cord. There's no space for that fluid there, definitely. I think the reason that I wanted to talk about these three types of neurons is because I ask you guys to think about disorders where these things aren't working. Uh, so there were two disorders that we talked about in the packet. Let me pull up a whiteboard here. Um, I don't have my notes directly in front of me, so um, help me out. The first one, was it called uh, congenital analgesia? Is that, that correct, right? Was that our first one? Congenital analgesia? Can't spell. And then um, congenital, ooh, wait. Insensitivity, okay, that was the first, there we go. Let, let's start over here, we're gonna start over. So congenital pain insensitivity, and then the indifference, thank you, okay. <laughs> congenital, Pain insensitivity and congenital pain indifference. Both of these fall under the big picture category of congenital analgesia. There we go. Now we're set. Okay. So we've got these two, two specific versions of this disease. If we're thinking about congenital analgesia in general, though, if you were to summarize big picture, um, congenital analgesia in, in patients that have either of, of these forms here of, of this disease, what is generally big picture? What's wrong with people with this disease? In general, what's the, the big picture problem? What's, what's not working? Yeah, they, they don't feel pain. They don't respond to pain. So... Uh, don't feel slash respond to pain. I mentioned it in the lesson, um, when I do this activity in, in real life with people, when we're not, you know, global pandemicking, I always like to ask, like, who doesn't want to feel pain anymore? Because when it, it first sounds kind of interesting, um, the idea of not feeling pain, but then we start to realize, especially when you watch, if you had a chance to watch the video about the girl who has this condition, um, when you start to realize everything that pain does for you, um, we realize actually it's probably a good thing that we can feel pain. We don't want maybe to feel as much pain as we do, especially if we have um, a, a pain disorder. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very sad, definitely. Um, but ultimately, big picture, pain protects us, right? Pain protects us. If we're doing something that um, is hurting our body, so like the video talked about where she scratched her cornea, scratched through her cornea, 
you definitely would have felt that. There's no way you would have you would have done that. Or um, it talks about her doing things like chewing on her tongue. You definitely would have felt that. Uh, the goal of pain is to keep you safe. So um, when we talk about either of these versions of congenital analgesia, it's the problem with uh, either feeling the pain or responding to the pain. We don't have that protective mechanism anymore. So you can really hurt yourself, really cause some damage. The difference between these two disorders really comes down to the last word in their name. So we've got insensitivity and we've got indifference. Now, uh, let's start with this word indifference over here. If someone were to ask you, let's pretend it, it's, it's simpler times, right? Let's pretend it's normal times. And we just finished up an awesome anatomy class together, right? Let's, let's reminisce. We'll pretend we just finished an awesome anatomy class. And let's pretend like we are all going to go out for lunch together, like one day, right? We'll, we'll do this again. Um, so we're all going to go out together. And somebody says, okay, we got, we got three options where, where we want to go. Here, I'll do a shout out to, to the friends that I had lunch with, right? Uh, we, were, we were talking about Sonic. We, we decided not to do Sonic, right? We had heard some horror stories about Sonic. Um, so, so we got Sonic um, in the brain lesson. Um, I told you guys that I worked at Subway. So our options are Sonic, Subway, or um, I'm trying to think back some of the places you guys told me you like to eat. Um, Chick-fil-A. Heard a lot of Chick-fil-A. Um, so we got three options. Our options are, are Sonic, Subway, or Chick-fil-A. I ask you where you want to go. If you tell me that you're indifferent to where we go, if you say you're indifferent, which I think all of us probably aren't indifferent, right? Uh, what, what might it mean if you said that you're indifferent? I'm indifferent. Yeah, I, I like the way that, that we're, we're saying it. Yeah, I don't care, right? I, I don't care. That, that's what always happens. Um, when I when I get together with with my with my family or with my husband's family and we have to make a decision, everyone's always like, ah, I don't care. And it's like, come on, guys, like somebody's got to care. We got to make a decision here. So if you're doing uh, if you have congenital pain indifference, think about that indifference word as I don't care. I don't care. If we have. Yeah, until someone says a place. Exactly. Until someone says, well, then let's do this. And all of a sudden you're like, uh, no, let's not do that. So absolutely. Okay. So congenital pain indifference. Indifference means I don't care. Over here on the other version of this sort of, we talked about congenital pain insensitivity. When we talk about someone being insensitive to something, uh, this one's maybe a little bit harder to put in easy words. Um, if you are insensitive, um, a lot of times the way we use that when we're talking about people is like you say something that's insensitive. Um, but but really what insensitivity comes down to is, um, yeah, that you, you don't care about other feelings or even in, in the context of, of what we're talking about here with our disorder is that uh, you, you don't feel it at all. So don't register it. It's not processed at all in your mind. So when we take this insensitive word and we combine it with, with pain, what it means for a patient who has congenital pain insensitivity, basically in easy words, is they don't feel pain. They're insensitive to it. They don't feel pain. When we talk about a patient over here with congenital pain indifference, Remember we said indifference means I don't care about it. There's kind of two ways that we could not care about pain. The first way we could not care about pain is uh, they don't process that pain is bad. The first problem I could have that makes me indifferent, that makes me not care about pain, is I feel what, what would be a normal pain sensation, but my brain says, I don't care. Like, I, I don't care what I'm feeling. Uh, but the second way this could be a problem is, is your brain could process that it's painful and the brain just, uh, uh, it, it, the brain doesn't want to respond. So they, they don't respond to the pain. 
I always like to, to give the example uh, of a hot burner, right? So you do, maybe we're doing a little more cooking. I don't know. Uh, really fast, let's do an informal poll. Underneath your screen, you've got a little person with a raising hand. How many of us are doing more cooking now that we're quarantined at home? How many of us are cooking more? I would be a raised hand on this. Yeah, a lot of us say that we're, we're cooking a little bit more right now. Um, my, I, we finally got brave at, at my house. I, it is silly to say this is brave. Um, but we finally got brave, and last Friday we actually ordered pizza. Um, up to that point, we were like, we are going to cook all of our own food and be really, <laughs> really cautious. We ordered pizza and none of us got sick, at least yet. So, um, but yeah, we're doing a lot of extra cooking over here at my house. So when I'm cooking, I've got a hot burner in front of me on my stove. Um, if I had congenital analgesia, where I've got a problem with pain processing, um, there, there are two things that could happen. The first thing that could happen is I could put my hand on a hot burner and I just don't feel that it's hot. I don't collect that kind of information. If I'm not feeling that kind of information, that, that temperature information, which of my kinds of neuron would be malfunctioning if I don't feel something, if I don't collect that stimuli? Which kind does that, collecting stuff? Yeah, a couple of us are, are chiming in. Yeah, if I'm not collecting, that, that pain information, that stimuli, that's an issue with my sensory neurons. And even if you look in its name, right, you kind of see that this is a sensory problem. Insensitivity, this is a problem with sensory neurons. So my sensory neurons either don't develop, I don't have them, or they, they aren't activated like they should be. If I put my hand on a hot burner and I don't even have any sensation that it's hot, that's congenital pain and sensitivity. If I put my hand on that hot burner and I have sensory neurons that collect that heat information and they send it back to my brain uh, and my brain processes that we're getting a message, but my brain um, doesn't know what that means. It doesn't know that, that that feels painful or if my brain knows that it feels painful but doesn't care and doesn't tell me to move my hand away, both of those would be an example of congenital pain indifference. So, um, yeah, when I start talking about congenital pain indifference, there's, there's kind of two ways that I can have, have issues with congenital pain indifference. Either, like several of us are chiming in, if I get that sensation, but I don't process it as something painful, I just process it as, oh, it's a, a temperature change, or, oh, I'm feeling something. I don't know what I'm feeling. I'm feeling something. That would be an interneuron issue. If my interneurons have... Uh, processed that oh this is a painful sensation um, and they decide that I, I shouldn't do a movement or if they decide that I should do a movement but I can't make that movement happen when I start getting into the I can't do anything about it anymore where I can't make that response happen even though I wanted to that's going to be an issue with the motor neurons so when we talk about congenital pain indifference there's kind of two different ways that I could experience this one. It could be an issue with my processing neurons or it could be an issue with my responding neurons, my motor neurons or my interneurons. When we talk about insensitivity, that's all about I don't feel pain like I'm supposed to feel. Now, what I'll tell you guys for the exam is that I'm not going to specifically ask you about these two disorders because on the exam, it is hard to know if we talk about congenital pain indifference, is that an interneuron problem or a motor neuron problem? Well, it could be either of them. So I'm not going to ask you about these specific disorders, but I am going to describe to you what's happening in a patient. And you need to know, is that an issue with their sensory neurons, where they're not feeling something? Is that an issue with their processing neurons, where something's not computing in their mind? Or is that an issue with their responding neurons? That's the motor neurons that make things happen. Um, Pilar's asking about where this is at. Yeah, the, the, this particular disorder was on page two of the packet. So it was underneath that picture of, of the three types of neurons. <coughs> 
So big picture with that learning objective is if you know what the three types of neurons do, the whole processing, detecting stimuli, or making movements happen, you should be able to answer that question. Just make sure we really know what those neurons do, and you should be in good shape for that question. I got a couple of questions from lecture number 11. In the little bit of time we have left here, I'm gonna bounce over to lecture 11. Let me pull that one up. I got questions, uh, let's start with the homunculus. We'll start with the homunculus and then we'll talk about primary versus association. Um, Emily, I have a hand raised from you. If you have a specific question, go ahead and type it into the chat for me. I'd be happy to answer it. Otherwise, it might have been just that you bumped it. It might still be from the cooking question, actually. Let me get rid of those ones. Uh, but feel free to, to type in a, a chat question if you still have one. Okay. Um, we are looking at what's called the sensory. No, you're totally fine, Emily. I, I, after I said that, I was like, I bet that's leftover. So um, when what we're looking at in this picture right here is called the sensory homunculus. There are a couple of ways that I know that it's sensory. Um, first, obviously, is the name that, that we gave you includes the word sensory. But the second way that we know this is a sensory or one is based on its location. Remember that the post-central gyrus is the bump that's in the back half of the brain. So the post-central gyrus is where the sensory one is. Because this is a, the sensory homunculus, um, is this one going to be sending information or collecting information? When we talk about the sensory homunculus, is this sending or collecting? information name next to it okay so we're we we start about 50 50 split and we've yep so we're we're bouncing back to the sensory homunculus is the one that collects sensory information what this map shows you is when you feel a sensation with your fingers when you feel a sensation with your toes when you feel a sensation somewhere on your face this shows you the exact place on, um, on your brain, on your post-central gyrus, where I would send that sensory information to. So when we were talking about the homunculus in class earlier this week, we mentioned that the size of a body part gives me an idea of how much information can be sent from that part of the body back to the brain. So when you're looking at the homunculus here, and we see this, this map, that's what we're calling a homunculus, is a map. When you look at this map, think about the size of a body part on you compared to the size of the body part on the map. They do not match up. So when you look at, at our map here, and we see our, our different body parts, what are some of the parts that on this map look bigger than they would you would expect on you? What are some parts that look like they're extra big? <coughs> Excuse me. Yep, the hands are extra big. The tongue, yeah, compare, because check this out. Look at this over. This is your entire torso right here. That's all we got for the torso. If we compare the size, the size of the torso is about the same as the size of the tongue. Wow. So the face, the lips, the nose, the fingers. Um, I would even argue too. check this out. Look at the size of your foot compared to the size of your trunk. We're getting a lot of sensory information down here from the feet as well. So um, big idea with the sensory homunculus, how much information comes back from a place on your body. If that place is really big on the map, and when I say really big, really let, let's think our reference point is to this right here. If this is your entire torso down through your hips and your legs, anything that looks bigger than it should compared to this part of your body, that's gonna be a part where we get a lot of sensory information. Any part that looks normal, so for example, the head, the head itself looks pretty normal, so that's things like the back of your head, your scalp. When we start talking about the face stuff though, the face is very big. Um, 
so the sensory homunculus, if I tell you we're looking at something on the post-central gyrus, this tells me how much sensory information I'm collecting from that place in the body. We also have what's called the motor homunculus. When I talk about the motor homunculus, so I'll type that for us here, motor homunculus. When I talk about the motor homunculus, now we're in the precentral gyrus. Remember that that means we're in the front half now, and the front half is where motor comes from. When I talk about the motor homunculus, am I sending information or collecting information in the motor homunculus? Now we're motor. Yeah, so motor means I'm sending. So the motor homunculus shows me the places in the body where I'm sending a bunch of directions where I'm telling the body what to do. So again, we're going to reference back to the size and shape of, of the trunk. That's always kind of going to be our reference point. Compared to the trunk and the torso of the body, what are some parts that look like they're getting extra motor information? Who's getting extra information on, on the motor homunculus? Yep, the hands are getting a whole lot of information. The face is getting a whole lot of information. None of us have really, really chimed in with it, but check out the size of the tongue again, right? So the tongue is very big compared to, to the, the trunk and the torso area here. So the motor homunculus gives me an idea of how many different kinds of movements I can do different places on the body. The sensory homunculus shows me how much different information I can collect. So again, when you're, you're working on the homework or when you're looking at the exam, if I ask you if somewhere gets a lot or a little information, compare it back to the trunk. Things that are not to scale, if you will, or if they're not the size that you would expect them to be based on the size of the trunk, if they're bigger or if they're smaller compared to this trunk, that helps you know if they get more or less than we'd expect. Something that's much bigger than we'd expect based on the size of the trunk, that gets a lot of information. Something that's about normal, we would just say it has a, a, a normal amount of information. And again, on Monday, we talked a lot about, about the homunculus. Um, I did see a good point that somebody made in the chat. We do want to know the difference between sensory and motor in terms of what these things do. So when I talk about the motor homunculus, um, this is the map that shows me how I send directions. So this map shows me that if I had decided to talk, which I, I'm doing way too much of, right? When, when I decide to talk, here's the place on my brain that sends those directions. If we go back, though, to our sensory homunculus, what this part on the sensory homunculus shows is, is not where I would send directions for talking. It's where I would receive uh, sensations from my lips. So for example, oh my gosh, my lips are chapped. I would feel that kind of information here. Um, so there is a difference between sensory and motor in terms of functions. Make sure we know what kind of information you get from these homunculi. Um, Robbie asked if there'll be pictures of these on the exam. Yes, I'm not going to ask you to memorize what a homunculus looks like. If I'm asking you questions about it, I'm going to give you the picture of the homunculus and ask you to interpret it. So you don't have to memorize this. You don't have to free sketch this. You'll have a picture of this if you need it. All right. One last topic I'm going to hit with you. Last thing somebody mentioned they wanted to talk about. Um, let me check really fast. Uh, we're, our, our friend Lexi was here earlier and she's not here anymore. Uh, Lexi asked about this, but somebody else asked about this too. So um, one last thing that, that uh, I had been asked to cover is the difference between a primary sensory area versus a sensory association area. And we did talk about this in office hours. So this shouldn't be totally new for us here. Um, for my friends who were here in the office hours that, that we talked about this, let's start with this one right here. Sensory association area. What does an association area help us to do? Does anyone remember? Association areas. 
Yeah, exactly. I like some of the words I'm seeing. So processing, giving it meaning. Um, really, when we talk about association, um, think about it how like we could play a word game, right? Where, where it's like an association word game. So I toss out, oh, this would be fun, right? With, with our class here. I literally was going to say, Parker, you'll appreciate this. I toss out the word blue and um, Parker would toss out the word dog, right? Because we've got blue doing class with us here today. Um, if I tossed out, yeah, Parker's dog, exactly. Um, if, I toss, if I said blue to my daughter though, she'd probably say blueberries. And if my daughter says blueberries, then I might toss back pancakes because we like to make blueberry pancakes. You know, so you do that association word game where you start with one word and you do like five different words that are related, totally changes. Um, when you think about a sensory association area, it's all about making connections or as somebody said, giving it meaning, giving it meaning. Association areas, if we didn't have these, you could look at the world around you and you'd have no idea what you're seeing. Um, an association area really does, as someone says, uh, help you with processing. Um, yeah, good question. What page are we on? Because it's the page that has those pictures of, of seeing and hearing. Yeah, somewhere around page four, probably. So it's the difference between a primary sensory area and an association area. So sensory association area. Think about these as the areas that help you to associate what you're seeing with something that you already know. Um, I, I kind of like to joke and think about how um, when I, I start to get to know students, I learn your faces first and I learn like where you sit in the classroom first and then I have to associate your face and the place you sit in the classroom with your name. So think about associations making connections. Um, when you see somebody on the street and you know you recognize their face, but you can't figure out what their name is, that might be an association problem there. So association areas, they, they give meaning to or help you process what you're seeing. Um, is it related to the pre-central gyrus? Um, no, pre-central gyrus is motor. Um, it's also not related to the post-central gyrus. So I'll, I'll come back to, to that in a little bit, Ariel. Uh, but it's not related to those things. Does anyone remember when we talked about the primary sensory areas? They're not really exciting. Um, but what did we say the primary sensory areas were? What's their job, the primary area? Does anyone remember? It'll take a little bit of typing for you. Yeah, receiving the information. Exactly. Um, the primary sensory area, uh, this is where where information first goes in the brain. So they get that information from the peripheral nervous system, so from the spinal nerves, from um, the cranial nerves. They get information and they just send it to a place in the brain. Um, primary sensory areas, they don't, um, they do no processing. This is just, it's literally where when you see something with your eyes, the first place in your brain it goes is back to the primary sensory area just to get it in the brain. For you to figure out what you're looking at, we have to use our, our visual association area. So association areas help you to figure out what it is that the primary area received. So think about primary sensory areas as they're the, the primary location, the first location, things go. I don't figure out what they mean until I get to an association area. Primarily, when we talk about association areas, the big ones that, that we want to know about or just have an idea of are the one, for example, that I, I tested with you guys in your lesson. By the way, those were some pretty cool inventions in Lesson 11, right? How many of you feel like some of those, those weird things I posted pictures for you? Anybody want any of those little, little inventions that, that were there in Lesson 11? If anyone happens to remember what I'm talking about. The knife holder. I liked that knife holder too. Yep. I could, I would totally put that in my kitchen, especially now when we're on quarantine, right? Like I could be real weird with a head knife block. Yeah. The, the baby floor duster. Yep. Especially with, with me soon having one that will be crawling again. I need one of those. I think that'd be super helpful. Okay. So the one that we played with in lesson 11 was the visual association area. 
which helps you to figure out when you're looking at a picture of what some of us are calling the baby mop, right, or the baby floor cleaner, helps you figure out, oh, it's not just a picture of a baby laying on the floor. That baby is cleaning the floor. Um, so the visual association area takes what you're seeing and helps you figure out what I might use it for. Um, auditory association area helps you to figure out what you're listening to. Is this music? Is this noise? Is this someone talking? Um, auditory association area. Um, the olfactory association area. Olfactory means smell. So figuring out what you're smelling, for example, relating it back to something you've smelled before. Um, so big idea with association is it's figuring out what it is you're experiencing. We do have, I'll, I'll mention this uh, in closing, we do have what's called a somatosensory association area. Uh, the somatosensory association area helps us to figure out what it is we're touching um, or helps us to figure out that the texture of what we're feeling feels a lot like silk or feels a lot like burlap. Um, so general senses, here's a word I don't really have time to review here, but um, general senses, that's your touch, your temperature, your pain, that kind of information, if I'm giving that kind of information meaning, that goes to my somatosensory association area. If we're talking about things like seeing or hearing or smelling, those were all things, remember, that we called special senses. And we talked about this on Monday, so go back to recording on Monday, special senses versus general senses. Um, big idea, though, is association is all about meaning. Um, the primary areas, that's literally just the, the way that I get it into the brain, the place I send it in the brain. Um, so Ashley asked, are we linking this to feelings and memories? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, the association area helps me to use memories that I have to figure out what I'm currently experiencing. And then Angelica asked, um, we go to a primary area first, and then we go to the correct association area. Yes. Um, we actually, so for these primary sensory areas, we, we have a primary visual cortex, is what it's called. Uh, we have a primary auditory cortex. So we, we actually have one for each of these, primary olfactory cortex. And hey, let's tie it in to a question I got earlier. The primary sense area that I send my general senses to, that's that thing that we called the sensory homunculus. The sensory homunculus. Or, as you see it labeled on the picture, the primary somatosensory cortex. So there you go. That's where that word came from. So I send those touch sensations, those pain sensations, to the sensory homunculus, but then I'll send them next door to a somatosensory association area to figure out what they mean. So primary versus, versus association areas. I am about out of time today. I mentioned at the beginning I've, I'm sharing, sharing this room with my husband. Um, he's going to be hosting a session in a minute, but I just want to pop a couple things up for you really fast before I have to leave you. Um, here's the first thing I wanna pop up for you guys. Since I am not with you when you take your exam, I'm gonna remind you of your two, two tips to make exams. Number one, go with your gut. Um, when you're going with your gut, that means we are not changing answers. So when you start taking that exam, please make sure that you don't change an answer that you picked at the beginning unless you have a really good reason to change your answers on the exam. Uh, second thing that I always tell you when you take the exam is to not lose your head. If you read a question and it blows your mind, the good news is you can come back to it later. You have clock. Um, don't let the clock freak you out, but also use the clock to let you know if I've been staring at this question for a minute and a half and I don't know the answer, it's time to move on. Um, really what education research says is if you've been on a question for a minute and you don't know the answer, it's time to move on. So give yourself about a minute per question. You have a little bit longer than that, but if you've been staring at a question for a minute and it's, it's blowing your mind, don't lose your head. 
just move on and, and find another question to do. So um, that exam is available for you now. You've got it available until uh, until Friday night. So please make sure to find yourself the best time where you can have no distractions or as few distractions as possible. Please make sure that your computer is fully charged and ideally maybe plugged into the wall so the battery doesn't die. And please, if possible, try to, to get as stable of an internet connection as possible. Because once you start that exam, the, the time clock starts. Um, so let's just have a good good exam experience. Yeah, Carrie says make sure you eat beforehand. Yes, your, your neurons do love their glucose, right? So get yourself a little bit of glucose. Get yourself a, a, a cup of coffee, right? Do your coffee before and during the exam. Um, so, so do what you can um, to help with that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I like that cup too. And, and here's my, my last minute encouragement for you right here. Um, I believe in you guys. You got this. So I know I'm not there to be your cheerleader in person, but pretend that I'm there. I'm rooting for you. I promise if you prepare for this exam, just like you prepare for your normal exams, you do have this. So um, do what you can to not psych yourself out for it. I know it's scary. It's a, it's a new format, um, but you guys have prepared for my exams before. I, I know that you can do this. Um, yeah, so good luck to everyone. Yes, whenever you take that exam. Um, Pilar mentioned the practice exam. Um, yeah, so let me just mention for you, I called it a practice exam. It's totally not content at all. It's, it's throwaway questions. It's like, do you know the name of your instructor? Like, it, th the reason I made a, a practice exam for you guys was to show you, here's what it looks like when the questions come one at a time and when you have a timer on your screen. So before you sit down to take the actual exam, just to get you in the zone to feel what it feels like to have questions one at a time, it's not a grade. No, it's, it's not worth any points. Um, it, it's just in there for you to, to get a feel for questions one at a time and for a timer. So um, before you take your actual exam, do take a moment just to click through it so you know what it's going to feel like. Um, that's available for you, and that's it's just going to sit there for you. So it's just to get you in the zone for what that test will feel like. So. Best of luck to you, especially to my friends who are, are going to work on taking that exam today or tomorrow or Friday. Um, it's posted right above, Gloria asked, where do you find that? Right above the actual exam. So the lecture exams folder, um, it's just called practice exam in quotes. So it's right there next to there. Um, yeah, tomorrow we're going to talk lab stuff. So bring your lab questions tomorrow. If you have other questions related to lecture, feel free to email me or I will, um, I'm making Friday just an open office hours time, so you can still bring, if you haven't taken the lecture exam yet, bring lecture exam questions, um, or you can bring lab exam, lab, not, lab packet questions for Friday as well. So good luck to you guys. Um, I'm gonna have to peace out to, to share the computer with my husband, but um, best of luck. I believe in you. Keep up your studying. Keep up the hard work. I, I know it's gonna pay off for you. So um, have a great afternoon. I'm gonna stop my recording and uh, probably going to log out here fast. So good luck with the exam, guys.